Hey everyone in Pop TV land, it's another edition of the Stoner Report with me, Marius Stoner. Here I am, and there you are. Oh, let me just uh, adjust the camera a little. Running a little late. I went out to Organics last night, dancing, uh, heavy techno music. It was a lot of fun. Walked home very late though, but that's a standard thing in Vancouver with the bus service so terrible. Um, how is everybody there in chat? Can you hear and see me okay? Uh, welcome to the show, by the way. Anyone? Let's see what we've got. Uh, 18 viewers out there, but nobody wants to say hi yet. Okay, well, no worries. I'll just continue on with the show. Um, last week, I, uh, after reviewing the show, and I uh, review appreciate you guys watching and I reviewed some of the uh, comments on the uh, YouTube page that you've been sending and I appreciate that too. Um, <clears throat> some of them were that there wasn't enough Canadian stuff and yeah that's absolutely true I uh, missed that that week. Um, I did add hemp after somebody mentioned hemp I think the first week and um, after reviewing the, the show myself I realized that I had, didn't say anything about Sensible BC which is really important. Um, I'm a canvasser myself. I've been out a couple of times so far, um, which is not very much in my opinion, but I'm gonna continue to go more and more. Um, lots of people are out there um, canvassing every day. We have uh, the Cannabus, uh, which is uh, traveling all over Vancouver right now. Um, I just today talked to Dana Larson, who uh, is an old friend of mine. Uh, he pr knew him when he was previously the editor of uh, <coughs> Cannabis Culture Magazine. In fact, he got me the job here way back when. Um, and yeah, he said that uh, every day more and more canvassers join and uh, more and more people become aware of uh, what's going on with Sensible BC and even people who may have passed by uh, the canvassers the first time around uh, after hearing about it and uh, uh, thinking it through. Uh, might come and sign the petitions anyway. So he's very hopeful that uh, that we're gaining momentum. Uh, he gave me some details, but I don't want to uh, I'll let him reveal uh, details on his own time. So uh, thanks, Dana. It's really, uh, I'm so uh, glad that you, oh, we got some music here. Can you uh, find out what's going on here? Yeah, thanks, Dana. And uh, <clears throat> if you're living in British Columbia, uh, and uh, you haven't signed the petition. And uh, oh, one sec. And uh, could you get my lights too? Yeah. Sorry, I'm a little bit in the dark here. <laughs> like I said, I went out dancing last night, so oh, my head is a little nice. bit fuzzy. Yeah, organics. I uh, once interviewed uh, on CCN News the uh, Chris Organics uh, for that uh, and it's still going on it's usually going on in the red room which is on richards in vancouver on thursday nights they're still trying to get to 23 west cordova for friday nights again but uh the red room is a nice little venue uh it's got some beautiful black light uh images all over by selena serotonin but uh yeah enough of the local stuff i think i'll just uh head right back into the news here and uh, some good news, starting off with some good news in the States. Oh wait, I actually was going to try a new format entirely here. Uh, instead of, uh, yeah, instead of just going through, I'll, I'll read you all the headlines first and then I'll go into them. <coughs> so first of all, forced drug tests for college students and no-no, the judge rules. Medical marijuana bill unlikely to pass in Wisconsin despite growing public support. Marijuana legalization bill introduced in D.C. A six-month-old taken from parents who grow use medical marijuana. Rand Paul decries mandatory minimum sentences, likens war on drugs to Jim Crow. DOJ to take hands-off approach to hemp cultivation. And a final story, industrial hemp, an historic cash crop that is good for the environment. So those will be the headlines that uh, I'll be reading today. And I'll start with the first one, forced drug tests. This one is from Philip Smith at Stop the Drug War. 
a U.S. District Court judge in Missouri ruled Friday <coughs> that a technical college violated the Fourth Amendment's protections against unreasonable searches and seizures when it ordered all students to submit to mandatory suspicionless dr drug tests. The judge did allow the drug testing of students in a small number of programs where school, school officials could make a reasonable argument that public safety was at stake. The ruling by Judge Nanette Lowry in Jefferson City came, to, came in Barnett versus Claycomb, a case filed in Lynn State Technical College students against the college and its president, Donald Claycomb, <clears throat> after the college announced in 2011 it would require all incoming students to undergo, undergo drug testing. Federal courts have traditionally held that drug testing by government entities without particularized suspicion that an individual is using drugs is unconstitutional. Federal courts have upheld only limited exceptions for minor school students, for certain law enforcement personnel, and for public safety. But Lynn State had argued that its policy was constitutional because some of the students were training in professions with public safety implications. And I think one more paragraph is important here. But citing the school's own admission that there has never been a drug-related accident in the 50-year history of the campus and closely reading previous federal court decisions on the public safety exception, Judge Lowry found that in only three academic programs of the 28 offered by the school, there was sufficient public safety interest that would allow suspicionless drug testing. Well, that kind of speaks for itself. Um, I don't know why people uh, love to uh, use people who use uh, drugs as a scapegoat and I guess uh, maybe to maintain control over them even even as students. I think we've discussed this before. Um, it's hard to know exactly what's on the mind of these crazies. But uh, on to the next story. Let's see and my bad for not having them all uh, lined up properly. And the one, next one is from Wisconsin. A sad story. Well, not tragic. Well, I guess it is tragic. You know, whenever these things happen in the political debate and they don't go the the way of uh, reason, it is tragic. Nobody wants to be a criminal. That's the thought that crosses John's mind each night he gets ready for bed. Part of his nightly routine involves breaking the law, but he doesn't lose any sleep over it. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. John, not his real name, uses medical marijuana to man manage the chronic neuropathic pain that he's lived in with for the past nine years. Now I'm gonna skip down a little farther. In fact, I'm going to have to go right into the story because although John's story is interesting, it's not really the political story that I'm looking for. And we only put in the snippets of the article, so it wasn't in the CC. So There are thousands of Wisconsin res residents illegally using medical marijuana, says Gary Stork. A Madison medical marijuana activist who co-founded the Wisconsin and Madison chapters of the National Organization for Reform of Marijuana Laws and the nonprofit IMMLY, Is My Medicine Legal Yet? So many people have been forced into making that choice, said Stork. But if some Wisconsin, <coughs> Wisconsin lawmakers have their say, they won't have to. Previous attempts to pass a medical marijuana legalization bill in Wisconsin have failed, but that won't stop Democrats from trying again this year. So that's basically what's happening now. It sounds like uh, it's not going to happen very soon, though, but they're keeping going to continue trying. Uh, so I'm not sure if those fireworks on the story were because of the uh, because marijuana legalization bill was introduced or July 4th uh, it could be either one it's a toss-up uh, a bill that would legalize the possession of small amounts of marijuana for adults over 21 and set up a system of regulated marijuana commerce was introduced in the District of Columbia City Council Tuesday 
filed by filed by council member David Grosso, Indiana at large, or independent at large. The bill would give regulatory authority to, D to the DC Alcoholic Beverages Regulation Administration. The bill comes on the heels of a decriminalization bill introduced in July by council member Tommy Wells. That bill will eliminate criminal penalties for the possession of up to an ounce of weed by adults and replace them with a maximum of a hundred dollar fine. The proposals appear to reflect public opinion in the nation's capital. In April, public policy polling survey found that 75% of district voters supported decriminalization and more than 60% would support a tax, regulate and legalize initiatives similar to those passed in Colorado and Washington this year. The same poll found that a solid majority were in favor of decriminalizing the possession of all drugs. 54% in fact. So that's, that's pretty amazing that uh, the residents of the district of Columbia are at odds with the lawmakers at the District of Columbia, which are supposed to represent the residents of the entire country. But you know, it's we've we've heard this before, and it's just another indication that uh, our government is uh, failed is failing the people, not only uh, in America but in Canada as well. Uh, Stephen Harper. Uh, it, is the same, uh, does not want to uh, listen to legalization. He's in favor of a bill that would um, al allow cops to ticket instead of uh, put people in jail, but in a way that, in, in many ways, that's just, just as bad because uh, the pot is uh, taken away, stolen from the person. Um, the offense is a ticketable offense. I'm not sure if you'd end up going to jail or not, but it w it does interfere with getting a driver's license and all sorts of legal matters if you don't take care of it. And uh, when really um, there is no real crime in smoking pot or possessing pot or even selling it if uh, you know one person needs it and you have it. Mm, let's see what time is it. Three thirteen. Okay, I got my cheech bong set up here and I'll be taking a puff out of it at 320 um, because somewhere it'll be 420 in the next time zone over so if anybody's watching from there uh, happy 420 then but that's not for another seven minutes okay now we got on a sadder note and I think we had a story like this last week about uh, this time it's a six-year-old that was abducted from uh, legally using medical marijuana patients. Uh, let me just, sorry, bring that up. I'm sorry for the delay here. I should have these already. Oh, I pressed the wrong page, that's why. Hmm. Here we are. Chanting Free Bree, a group of about 100 protesters gathered outside state welfare offices in Lansing, Michigan. I think it's Michigan, yeah. They're upset over the state's decision to remove a six-month-old girl, Bree, and a six-year-old boy from their parents' home because they grow and use medical marijuana. The parents claim to have a state-sanctioned license to do so. Maria and Gordon Steve Green use medical marijuana to, to treat Gordon's multiple sclerosis and epilepsy. A referee made the decision to have Michigan Child Protective Services remove the children, saying that the Green's home is unsafe. They were worried about the possibility of a break-in or armed robbery, that kind of thing, said Maria Green. Covert says child welfare workers acted after Mar Maria Green's former husband complained. He's the father of the boy. The baby is now in the care of Maria's mother, Mrs. Green. Oh, Mrs. Green says the Department of Human Services is stealing her baby. The Greens insist that their home is safe and loving environment. <coughs> Tim Skubek reports that the state of Michigan will not comment about details on the cases like this because privacy issues and the director of human services said this 
The safety and well-being of the child is paramount for any of our investigators when they are doing their job, said DHS spokesman David Ackley. Well, this is, a, this is like a really disgusting story of how it looks like uh, some ungruntled ex-husband uh, complained to the authorities using, uh, using drug laws, well, non-existent drug laws, uh, to take the child away. Uh, and the worry isn't even about the drug use, it's about uh, the possibility of a break-in or armed robbery. So that's, that's like, I suppose that if you carry that logic uh, to its uh, conclusion, and that's, that's one, of, one way of logically finding uh, problems and arguments, it's called reducto ad absurdum, that uh, you better start taking children away from rich homes because, you know, there's going to be a lot of break-ins and, uh, you know, just start from there and reducto ad absurdum. Uh, and it just looks like that a jealous ex-husband is interfering. Or maybe he just doesn't like weed. I, I, I can't say what his motives are. But without the drug laws, this wouldn't be happening. Rand Paul. Now he's, this isn't the first time I think he's decried the drug war, but he's come out saying that it's the new Jim Crow. And um, there was a book, there is a book, I have not read it yet, but I do want to read it, uh, by Michelle Alexander called The New Jim Crow. Uh, so maybe he just read it. <laughs> we'll see. At a packed public hearing in the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee on Wednesday, Senator Rand Paul compared the war on drugs to the racist policies of the Jim Crow era. If I told you that one out of three African American males is forbidden by law from voting, you might think that I was talking about Jim Crow 50 years ago, Paul said. Yet today, a third of African American males are still prevented from voting because of the war on drugs. The majority of illegal drug users and dealers nationwide are white, he said but three-fourths of all people in prison for drug offenses were African-American or Latino. Paul was arguing against mandatory minimum sentencing laws, which require judges and prosecutors to impose severe penalties against those convicted of low-level drug crimes. A growing number of conservatives have criticized such laws in recent years. At, at the hearing, Mark Levin, the policy director of the Right on Crime Initiative at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, a conservative group that advocates for prison reforms, noted that Texas has reduced its prison population and crime rates while expanding its use of recidivism reducing programs and other alternatives to incarceration. Recidivism reducing. Okay, well that's probably means uh, stopping people from going back into prison after they leave. So that's, that's a good sign that uh, more people, as, uh, as we remember last week, uh, John McCain said, hey, maybe we should legalize pot. Um, Rand Paul has, uh, I'm not, I don't agree with uh, all of Rand Paul's views on many topics, but I won't get into that now, but uh, I'm really glad that he's an advocate to end the drug laws. Oh, it looks like it's 3.20, so happy 4.20 in those people in Alberta, and uh, I'm not sure what part of the states, I'll look it up for next time. And I'm going to pack up my nice cheese, cheese pump. You guys, pretty soon. Oh, I don't even have water in here. Jeremiah, can you quickly grab me a water? Sure. Thanks so much. Um, you guys, pretty soon we'll see. We got a whole whack load, I'm trying not to swear, of cheech bongs for the lounge here. I mean, this is, this is mine. Uh, it was given to me uh, last week. And... Uh, one of the, the lounge staff members got one too, and I think there's at least Jeremiah's got a few. I think he's going to show them show them to you on his show. Uh, we got uh, I think ten for the lounge, and Jody got a couple too. A couple of really nice small ones. One's a panda bear. Oh, thanks so much. And these cheese bongs are pretty nice. There's controversy, like I said, but uh, I don't know which way the wind's blowing on this one, so I'm just going to stay out of it and see see what happens. 
Alright, so I'll just fill this up with some water and get some weed. Only got a couple of stories left. Um, thanks everyone for joining me. And for those of you watching in the repeat, I hope this uh, helps you keep up weekly with the uh, uh, cannabis events as it is as, as it is for me. <laughs> and yes, I know I should probably have this all ready. Ahead of time. It's already 3.22 and I have not taken my bong rip yet. So, sorry about the delay. If I was Greg, I'd probably say it's satellite delay, but no, no, no. <laughs> not only he would be joking, of course, too. And yeah, and uh, you should watch our other shows. Greg's show at 4 and Jeremiah's show at 4. Uh, today, Greg's show is on Wednesday. Uh, Al the Alchemist has a show. I don't think we're able to broadcast it on Pot TV as it is, but we put it up later. Later here. <coughs> and here's to freeing to weed, freeing the weed. And thanks to uh, Cheech Glass Limited again for this bong and that bong hit. Okay, we got a, a couple more stories, and they're both hemp stories. I think I moved it around on myself to put them both together. So one sec, I've lost it. Here it is. From this one's from Vermont. A Vermont farming group is cheering the Department of Justice memorandum that it says should could clear the way for a worry-free cultivation of hemp by the. 2014 growing season. A DOJ directive issued late last month announced the federal agency would be taking a hands-off approach to producers and sellers of marijuana in two states that recently legalized the drug. But agricultural officials say the ruling could also have a significant impact on states that have legalized hemp, which is a form of cannabis that lacks any psychotropic power, but is nonetheless classified as a Schedule I narcotic by the federal government. The federal definition of hemp is the same as for marijuana, so any ruling that the Justice Department has given regarding marijuana should apply to hemp as well, according to legal opinions I've been given, says Rob Kidd, an organizer with rural Vermont. Which, this is a, an example of uh, reducto ad absurdum that just seems to exist and nobody seems to realize how absurd it is, at least not the people who are able to change it. Governor Peter Shumlin, earlier this year, signed into law a bill that legalized the cultivation of hemp in Vermont. But while the statute freed would uh, while the statute freed would-be growers from prosecution by the states, the prospect of federal interdiction and the destruction of crops or seizures of land that might accompany an arrest dampen far farmers' enthusiasm for taking advantage of the new law. One of the few farmers to publicly announce his attention to grow hemp in Vermont has planned on purchasing a small plot of land through a separate limited liability company so as to protect his assets from forfeiture should fe federal officers opt to prosecute. So that's... Uh, really ridiculous again I seem to be saying that a lot that uh, one of the most uh, valuable crops um, 
is still illegal in the states, uh, considering that uh, the Declaration of uh, Independence was written on hemp par parchment, and yada yada. And just one last story. This is more on hemp, and it's from uh, Living Green magazine. <clears throat> and <clears throat> so that would be an environmental uh, slant on it, or point of view. And it points out that uh, industrial hemp is good for the environment. Slowly, the battle to reconstitute industrial hemp has been sweeping across the nation. States such as Colorado have now committees to govern the inspection of industrialized hemp to assure its proper growth and safety. Safety. The committee in Colorado has until the beginning of 2014 to devise a method in which to register prospective farmers. Even research conducted from colleges and universities for the use of industrial hemp has been approved in a very close eight-vote margin. Many other states are joining this collection of hemp production and future development as legislatures is being passed to enable the industrialization of this misunderstood plant. Well, only misunderstood because of the misinformation. Although hemp is nearly identical to marijuana, it is indeed a separate plant. The THC levels within the hemp are minuscule in comparison to its twin. Because these two plants are closely related, they have been both deemed as marijuana, although they are significantly different. So that just leads into the same information we had on the last story. And uh, that will be uh, the end of uh, the Stoner Report for this week. Thank you for joining. Again, if you're in British Columbia, please sign uh, the Sensible BC petition. Don't wait until the last few days, because you might, you might miss it, right? If you see a canvasser, uh, <clears throat> uh, go there, come up to him and sign it. That's when, when I'm a canvasser, most of the signatures I get are people just coming up to me and asking me, can I sign this, please? So be one of those people. If you have the extra time and the energy and the will, become a canvasser. Um, I don't know the exact, I don't know the phone number right now, but go to sensiblebc.ca for all the information you have. Uh, there's more and more canvassers each day. Um, it's just, uh, it, we're all going to have a big, big party at the end of this, no matter what happens. So join, if just for that, and be part of that energy. Um, thanks to everybody who uh, is working on the Sensible BC campaign and all the canvassers and who have signed already. Um, a lot of people say that, hey, America has done it before us, so that's kind of sad, but let's, let's, let's catch up, okay? So thanks again for watching. I will see you next week. Peace out.